whenever you're living for God, there is a fine line between walking in wisdom and operating in fear. And it's easy to use them interchangeably if we're not discerning. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Amanda Pittman and I talk about faith, confidence, and lifestyle from a Christian woman's perspective. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about operating in fear versus walking in wisdom. The Bible talks about fear a lot and the Bible talks about wisdom a lot. We're not gonna be able to get through all of the scripture because it truly is dense, but I'll highlight the big ideas. I'll show you the clear differences between fear and wisdom so that you can make good decisions. First, let's talk about what we don't wanna do, operating in fear. Let's think about it. Fear causes you to fight, flight, or freeze. If you are bound by fear, it can cause you to do any of these three things, none of which are good. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So we know that the source of fear does not come from God. If the source of fear is not a God-like source, if we submit to fear, we will not have God-like fruit. Fear can't produce righteousness and fear can't produce godliness. If God hasn't given you fear, then if you are operating under fear, you cannot do what God has appointed you to do. This is why I believe the spirit of fear quenches the spirit of God. Generally speaking, our fear has to do with people. How are people gonna look at us? How are people gonna respond? Are people gonna reject us? Are they gonna abandon us? Are they gonna hurt us? Are they gonna kill us? Fear generally has to do with the response of people rather than the commands of God. Okay, so let's talk about the fear of man because it says in Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man lays a snare. But then on the flip side, whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. These are polarized. They are dichotomous. Either you can fear man and it be a snare, or you can trust in the Lord and he'll keep you safe. But you can't do both. At the end of the day, it just boils down to who do you fear more? Do you fear God more or do you fear people more? Fear is saying that you trust the power that people have over your life more than you trust the power that God has over your life. You fear the danger that man poses more than you trust the safety that God brings. And there are many times when pleasing people and pleasing God intersect. They're not always at odds with one another. But many times if we're operating out of fear and not fear of God, but fear of man, it keeps us from being obedient to God and it keeps us from doing what he has called us to do. Matthew 10, 28 says, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This scripture is like an anchor for me in my life because there are many times where I can fear people. There are times where I struggle with intimidation. There are times where I struggle with the fear of outcomes, the fear of being judged, so many different fears. However, one of the things I think about is that nobody's going to really remember me once I'm gone. You know, like I really don't know my great, great, great grandparents. And even though Michael Jackson died, I maybe think of him once or twice a year. When you're gone, people move on. People are gonna forget you. Your days are numbered. We're like grass. Our lives are like a vapor. We are gonna be in eternity much longer than we're gonna be here on earth. I like to think of my decisions in light of eternity. We're all going to stand before God one day and we're going to have to give an account for everything that we said, did, didn't say, didn't do. We're going to have to give an account for all of those things. Now, when I say give an account, I'm not talking about salvation. When it comes to salvation, it's very clear. Did you accept Jesus or did you not? Yes or no. But whenever it comes to the types of rewards that we get in heaven or the honor that we get in heaven or how God assesses us when we get there, we are gonna be measured by the things that we did. How did you use the time that God gave you? How did you steward the mind that, that God gave you and the commands that God gave you? What did you do with God's word? What did you do with God's people? We need to be prepared to give an account to Jesus for that. And so ultimately fear of man is temporary, but when you fear God, you're thinking about the greater authority and who you're gonna to answer to when all of this is said and done. Another thing I love about that scripture is it really highlights how limited the power of man is in relation to the power of God. We can get so in our heads about how powerful people are. This person has so much money. This person has status or this person is a boss. Like they, they have the power to fire me. It's so easy to get caught up in the power that man has and we forget about the power that God has. We forget about the reality that if we are disobedient to God and hopes to please man, then we are leaving 
feeling the safety of God's protection. So who do you fear more, God or man? You have one life to live. Are you going to be in self-preservation mode or are you going to be in God glorification mode? And then there's Galatians 1 and 10. In this passage of scripture, Paul says this, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I still trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's a bold statement for Paul to make. If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. This scripture shows us what is at stake when you're a slave to fear, when you're a people pleaser, when you lack boldness, when you lack courage, when you can't do what it is that God has called you to do. You forfeit your ability to be considered a servant of God because you're no longer serving God. You're preserving yourself and serving people. Here's the thing. If you serve God, first and foremost, you will inevitably serve people. Fear God first and foremost, and he will show you how to walk in wisdom. And that leads me to the second part of this video, which is walking in wisdom. What does it look like to walk in wisdom? Did you know that there is a good fear? Okay, rock with me here. Multiple times throughout the scripture, there's a verse that says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What the Bible is saying is that fearing God is what makes you wise. In my own walk with the Lord, I have a legitimate fear of God. Here's why. In times where I have disobeyed God, in times where I have made decisions that did not line up with his word or didn't line up with what he was leading me to do, it has always come back to bite me in the butt and I've always been left with regret. Anytime I have heeded the word of the Lord, anytime I have heeded scripture, anytime I have heeded wisdom, God blesses me and blesses me more and more abundantly. And so I have been through enough just crazy circumstances from blatantly disobeying God, just seeing how much that backfires on me that I have a legitimate fear of going down the wrong path. There was one time I was on this very strict diet. You can only eat certain foods and you can only eat a certain amount of those foods. And I was able to do it nearly to perfection. Why? Because if you didn't follow it perfectly, then the inverse of what you want would happen. You'd actually gain weight at a very rapid rate. And so because the the flip side, the punishment of not doing it by the book is far worse than the reward of doing it the right way, it kept me on the straight and narrow of following this specific diet and being successful with it. And I believe that that's how the Lord deals with me when it comes to obedience. Any time I slip, any time I go a little bit wayward, either the Lord will correct me really quick or if he doesn't correct me really quick and I stay down that path for an extended period of time, I will reap consequences that I did not want to deal with. And he'll let me deal with the full consequence of that. There may be some mercy laced in it, but he doesn't let me off easy. He lets me deal with the consequences of my actions. So what I learn and so that I gain wisdom. This is the reason why I have the fear of the Lord. This is why I want to walk in a very righteous way and go the right way because the inverse, I fear. And then on the other side, I have seen God come through for me time and time and time again, walking step by step, doing things when I don't understand, walking in his wisdom when it looks like foolishness to the world, making really big moves in faith and seeing him come through time and time and time again. And what it's taught me is that God can be trusted. Even when I'm afraid, God can be trusted and he will bless my efforts and he will bless my obedience. So there's so much goodness wrapped up in it. And I know that he allows me to deal with the consequences of my missteps so that I learn that his way truly is best. There's blessing, there's life, there's goodness. I love that the Lord allows me to see that firsthand so that I know, I taste, and I see that the Lord is good. It's not theoretical knowledge, but it's lived experience. And when I get that deep down in my soul, you don't really have to tell me twice, okay? The fear of the Lord can be very literal. Now, with that comes reverence, with that comes respect, with that comes honor, but Many times we have such a orphan spirit, almost like this abandonment place that we come to where we feel like there is no Father God. 
there is no one to be accountable to. And when, when you have this mentality of that, God is not keeping tabs on me. He is not keeping me accountable. That's actually a very scary place to be in. And our society is very much like that. And that's why we're lacking order. That's why we're lacking the structure that God has put in place is because we almost have that fatherlessness mentality toward God. So seeing God like a father who's willing to discipline you, but a father who also deeply loves you helps you to walk in wisdom. James 1 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. It really is that simple. If you want the wisdom that comes from God, ask him. He's not a bad father who will withhold good things from you. God wants you to be wise even more than you want to be wise. Ask, seek, knock. In Matthew 24, Jesus says this, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So another function of wisdom is doing what Jesus has instructed us to do in his scripture. He has already made a lot of things clear in his word. So when we build our life on the foundation of his word and we follow what he has already set in place, it's like building a house on rock. Wind can come, waves come, rain comes, but we still have a firm foundation. Inversely, there's absolutely zero wisdom in doing things the way that the world does. There's zero wisdom in sin, in folly, in deception. There's zero wisdom in any of that. Which leads me to one of my favorite scriptures, 1 Corinthians one twenty five, which says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Simply put, there are certain things that the world will deem as foolish or don't take all that. Okay, sky daddy. They don't realize that this way, walking in this way, following the scripture, following the voice of God, doing things God's way is actually a strategic advantage against the plot of the enemy. And I love that it says the weakness of God is stronger than human strength because we greatly overestimate how wise we are, how strong we are, how powerful we are, how knowledgeable we are, and we underestimate how strong God is, how knowledgeable he is, how wise he is. And so even the tiniest, I mean, pinky flick of God is like, it's kind of like Thanos, right? Like God can just snap his fingers and we're all gone. That's how powerful the Lord is. And for us, there's, there's, there's no man who is strong enough to do that. So understanding how infinitely wise God is, how infinitely strong he is, how infinitely greater he is than us, it'll put us in a posture to receive wisdom from him and not wisdom from the world. There's also Proverbs 21, 5. This says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. In this passage of scripture, haste and diligence are at odds. Now, there are times in scriptures where the Lord commands to make haste, but those are more of the exception rather than the rule. The rule is remain diligent, remain where your feet are, don't be too quick to make judgments, don't be too quick to do anything, and take your time. Don't try to cut corners, don't try to do things the world does it for the sake of speed. It's hard to do things right in a hurry. And whenever you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was never in a hurry. He didn't run anywhere. He was always walking and he was always present right where his feet were. And one of the reasons why he had that mentality is, is he understood his assignment there on earth. And he knew that there was an appointed time for everything. There would be an appointed time for him to be baptized, an appointed time for him to be tempted in the wilderness, for him to lead his disciples, for him to do signs, miracles, and wonders, an appointed time for him to be persecuted, an appointed time for him to die, an appointed time for him to raise to life, an appointed time for him to come back. When you understand that God orders your steps, you understand the appointed time for all things. In James 1, 19 through 20, it says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Many times wisdom looks like slowing down, breathing, taking time to deliberate, taking time to think, to ask God questions, to pray. When we take time, it allows us to receive from the Lord, keeps us in a place of humility, and it gives distance between something that's prompting us and our reaction to it. If God didn't tell you to hurry, then take your time. 
And then the last scripture I'll share on walking in wisdom is this. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. You trust God in everything and you're doing something from a good place. And so when you look at James 3.17, this should keep you wise in all of your dealings. Remember to remain diligent. Don't be in a hurry unless God tells you to. Make sure that everything is coming from a right place and a right motive. And in all things, you are fearing the Lord, not fearing people. And you're asking him for your next steps and him for wisdom on how to make your decisions. To sum up this entire video, this scripture puts it perfectly. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Living for God is not always easy. Many times you have to face your fears and confront your fears to do what is wise and righteous in God's eyes. And sometimes you need to slow down, take a deep breath so that you operate out of wisdom and you don't operate out of any other spirit. And with that information, I hope that you make the best decisions. Well, guys, if you like this video, make sure that you give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or feedback, leave a comment below. Make sure you share, subscribe if you haven't already. And all the links to my books, coaching program, and so much more are in the description box below. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.